I'm Mario Vázquez, Senior Software Engineer at Red Hat, and today we are going to talk about container security, an introduction to capabilities and second profiles. Let's get started. So first things first, what are Linux capabilities? Before jumping on what capabilities are, we need to understand that in Linux, we have two types of processes. Uh, privileges processes, whose effective user ID is zero, also refer to them as super user processes or root processes, and then unprivileged processes, whose effective UID is non-zero. Privileged processes bypass all kernel permission checks. Uh, on the other hand, unprivileged processes are subject to full permission checking based on the processes credentials, usually effective UID and effective GID, and also supplementary group list. Starting with kernel 2.2, Linux divides the privileges traditionally associated with super user into distinct units, known as capabilities, which can be that independently enabled and disabled. And those capabilities are a per thread attribute, meaning that every thread will have its own capability uh, assigned. So if you look at the image in this slide, you can see that we have here um, a box with root. This is before the Linux kernel 2.2. At that point, root processes were assigned full privileges and you cannot remove privileges, privileges from those processes. Then after Linux kernel 2.2, uh, we have uh, the same root process, but now we have different capabilities, which are the blue boxes here. So in this case, we can assign different privileges to the process. In, um, in this image, this represents that this process has the whole uh, root privileges like it was in before Linux kernel 2.2. And then we have this third image where we have the same root process, but now uh, we only assign three capabilities in this case, which means that this process is on, only able to use those capabilities and not the other ones that were removed. So it doesn't have the whole root uh, privileges enabled. Some examples of capabilities. Well, we have, for example, the net row, which will allow the process uh, to use row and packet sockets. Then we have, for example, chown that will allow the process to make arbitrary changes to five UIDs and GIDs. And there is a lot more of capabilities. There are like uh, around 30, if I recall correctly. But anyway, at the end of the slides, there's a link where you can go and check the whole list of capabilities um, present on the Linux kernel as today. Why we talk about capabilities? Because sometimes we will need to use them on containers. And in fact, container runtimes already use capabilities. So for example, you can check the default capabilities enabled by Cryo um, on the link on the slides and also the ones enabled by default by Containerd on the link on the slides. So at the end of the day, as you know, containers are processes running on our system. So we can assign those capabilities to those processes, which are containers. Default capabilities enabled by the runtimes are assigned to every container. If the user does, does not add or drop additional capabilities, all your containers will get the capabilities that are defined as default on the runtimes. Then one question that you will get during the presentation, which is, okay, how can I know which capabilities are required by my application? So there is no magic tool that will tell you which capabilities are actually required. Um, the developer needs to understand what capabilities will be required by their application. For example, if we have an application that listens on port 80 uh, and we want to run that application as a non-root user, which means a non-privileged process, uh, we will need the netbind service capability, which allows a process to bind a port below 124 without being privileged, right? So that's something that the developer need to know. That's, there is no tool that will give you that uh, information. Okay, so as you can see here in the screen, there is a bunch of text. Um, there are five capability sets. Uh, I, I don't want to get into too many details. We will see how they work during the demo. You just need to know that those uh, capability sets are used by the kernel to run some permission checks. And depending on the configuration of the, of the different sets, 
your process will be able to get some capabilities or not. Then on top of thread capabilities, we have file capabilities, which are capabilities assigned to an executable file and that upon execution will be granted to the thread. The file capabilities are stored using one bit uh, on the file system, but they act as, a dif as different file capability sets. So they, they are not uh, sets actually, but they work like if they were. And for file capabilities, we have only three sets, permitted, inheritable set, and effective set. Uh, you have seen those on the previous slide, as I mentioned uh, before, we will see this in action. So let's go with demo one, capabilities on containers. In this first demo, we are going to see how we can run a container locally and get its thread capabilities. So in order to do that, I will be using Podman. And as you can see here, we are running Podman, this image. And this image has an application that listens on a given port, but that's not important for now. We will be using this image uh, during the demos. Okay, so now we have the, the container running. Uh, we can get uh, the container PID using this command, podman inspect. And we can always get capabilities from the proc file system. So if we query uh, cap on the proc, the container PID status, we will get the different um, thread capability sets. As you, if you remember, the inherited, permitted, effective, bounding, and ambient. Um, as you can see, this returns the uh, capability sets in X format, and we can use a tool named capsh to get them decode. For example, let's decode the effective set in this case. Okay, so now you can see that uh, this thread has the following capabilities, shown, DAC override, F owner, et cetera, et cetera. When using tools such podman, uh, we can also use commands as podman inspect, and then get me the effective caps, okay? That will be the same output. And with that, uh, we conclude this first demo. But now what we are going to do is we're going to show the differences between running a container with UID zero versus a running a container with non-root UID. If you remember, we mentioned in these slides that there are differences between privileged processes capabilities and non-privileged processes capabilities. So what we are going to do in this, uh, this time is we are going to run the same container, sorry, the same image using user, user zero. And um, using the entry point being bus, we will run the grep command inside the container. So that will show us the thread capabilities for the container. Okay, so now, uh, we run this grep and you can see here that we have the same capabilities that we saw before, okay? And the important thing here is that we have those capabilities in all sets. As you can see here, those are in the inherited, permitted, effective, bounding. The ambient set, it's, it's not a set. Okay, so now we can exit the container and now what we can do is run the same command, but this time we are using a non-root UID. In this case, we're using the 124 UID. Okay, so if I run ID, we are that one. Okay, if we run the same command, look at this. So we have all sets, uh, all sets have been cleared, so all zeros, which means that uh, we cannot get any capabilities because those are not in the inherited or permitted set. Um, as you can see here in the bounding set, we still have the capabilities that um, were present on the privileged processes. The, the privileged process uh, in this case has created this container and that process had these capabilities. So those are in the bounding set as we have seen on these slides. Okay, so now we can exit. Um, so what, what we can do now is we can run this same command, but at this point we are requesting this capability, cap netbind service, okay? So what we are doing here is we are telling the container runtime that we want to be able to use this capability. 
uh, what will happen then is that the runtime will put that capability into the ambient set. Sorry. Okay, so now we requested that uh, capability. And if we run the web command, you can see the difference. So um, we got uh, the bounding set as we as before with the whole capabilities, but now in the ambient and then the effective permitted and inherited, we got uh, only the the netbind service capability. So this means that this container can only use uh, the netbind service capability. Okay, and now we can exit. Okay, for the next demo, what we are going to do is we are going to show a more real world scenario, let's say. We mentioned earlier that our application uh, can choose which port it listens on um, by the use of an environment variable. So what we are going to do is we're going to try to run our application uh, using an unprivileged user on this unprivileged port 8080. Okay, so that works. Our application is listening on port 8080. So the next text that we are going to do is, <clears throat> okay, we want to run this application, but with an unprivileged user, but on a privileged, we want to listen on a privileged port number 80. And as you can see, we get um, a permission denied because we don't have the privileges to bind to that port. Um, so what happened is that even if the runtime has the netbind service on the default um, capabilities uh, that are assigned to containers, as you have seen in the previous demos, the the capability sets get cleared when you run, uh, when you exec DE from a more privileged to a less privileged uh, process. Okay, so what we need to do now is, okay, we know that we need netbind service. So what we are running, what we are doing is we are running the same container, the same user uh, on the 80, on the privileged port 80, and we are adding the cabinet bind service capability. So you can see that this time we were able to bind to port 80 because we have the privilege required to do that. Now let's move on to file capabilities. If you remember from previous tests, uh, if you remember from the slides, we talk about something called um, file capabilities. So what are those file capabilities? Are capabilities that get us that are assigned to executable files. Okay, so in this case, when we created our container image that we will be using, we used this command, set cap, and then uh, the capability that we want to add, the file capability th that we want to add, and then in the effective and permitted sets, and the binary. In this case, this is the binary for my application. That means that my binary, um, when gets executed, will try to um, get this capability assigned to the to the to the application thread. Let's try. So again, we run this image. We are going to get the file capability. Okay. So we have this other command, get cap, where we can query the binary, and it will say, okay, this is the file capabilities that I have assigned. In this case, it only has netbind service. Um, so as you can see, the thread capabilities at this point are cleared out, but we have the bounding set. If you remember from the slides in the bounding set, the bounding set controls which capabilities can be added to the inherited and permitted sets. So if we run capacitates decode, we will see that cabinet bind service it's right there, which means that a file, that a binary that has a file capability uh, of cabinet bind service will be able to request that capability. Let's see how. Let's run our application in background. Okay. So it's, it's working as you can see. And we got this uh, PID number five. 
So what we are going to do now is we are going to get the, capa the thread capabilities for this uh, for this bind, uh, thread. And as you can see, this um, this thread, the, th the thread for PID number five, only has this capability netbind service added to the threads capability because that's the one that um, the binary requested by the file capabilities. But at this point, maybe you can think that uh, you can bypass capability checks, uh, well, bypass thread capability checks. But let's see if that's possible or if it, or if it actually it's not. So we have this command, podman run, uh, same thing. We are using the same entry point and privilege user. And we are requesting the runtime to drop all capabilities. Uh, we are still setting the app port to port 80 and we are using the image that has the file capabilities. Okay. So if we look at the capabilities, now everything, every set is clear, including the bounding set. If if we run the get cap user being reverse course, you can see that it has the, the file capability. So let's see what happens if we try to run this binary. Okay, the kernel blocks the execution. Why? Because the binary is trying to get uh, that file capability into the um, thread capability but the thread capability cannot uh, acquire that capability because the bounding set, uh, it's clear. So the parent process cannot create processes with that, those capabilities because itself doesn't have those capabilities in the bounding set. So can we bypass uh, capabilities kernel checks? The answer is no. And with that, the demos around uh, capabilities on containers are finished. We will see in the future how we can leverage capabilities on Kubernetes. Now that we are done with demo one, let's continue with secure computing. So what is secure computing or second? So applications usually require a small subset of the underlying operating system kernel APIs. For example, if we have an HTTPD server, it won't require the mount syscall at all because why would the web server need access to run the mount syscall? Um, so in this case, why should the app have access to this syscall? How can we limit that? So in order to limit the attack vector of a subverted process running in a container, the second Linux kernel feature can be used to limit which syscalls a process has access to. The previous example, um, we could say, okay, the HTTPD uh, process can only use this subset of syscalls that I know that are required for the HTTP server to run and nothing else. By default, Kubernetes runs everything as unconfined, which means that all syscalls are available to the containers processes. In Kubernetes 1.22, a new alpha feature will allow users to configure a default second profile that will be applied to all workloads otherwise specified which means that uh, you could have a default uh, second profile that will be applied to workloads on your cluster. And then uh, if you need something different, you need to provide a different uh, second profile or run the, the workload as unconfined. In OpenShift, for example, we have a default second profile that will reduce the number of syscalls available uh, for containers to use but that profile is not applied by default to workloads. We need to ask to say, I want to use that profile. Okay, so the next question will be, how can I create my own second profiles? And the answer is that creating second profiles uh, can be tedious and it often requires deep knowledge of the application. For example, a developer must be aware that a framework that sets up a network server to accept connections would translate into calling socket, bind, and listen system calls. So as you can imagine, that's not something very common. But there are some tools that can help you to get the, the syscalls that are being done by an application. For example, you have tools such as OCI second BPF hook that we will use in, in our next demo. 
that will give us the syscalls being used by a process. Um, or you can also use tools as S-trays, BPF filters. There are uh, many tools out there that you can get the syscalls being, being used by a process. Then there's another thing that you need to keep in mind. And is that if when you're creating a second profile for containers, for example, for Kubernetes, you need to keep in mind that you want to create that profile under the same container runtime that you are using in your cluster. For example, if you are using CRUN, you want to create the second profile using CRUN as a base. If you are running RUNC, you want to create the second profile using RUNC as a base. Okay, and now we have an example of a second profile. So we can see how it looks like. The first thing that we see is the default action. The default action will be the action that will be applied to syscalls that are not defined inside our profile. In this case, we are setting this to uh, error, which means that um, syscalls that are not allowed in our uh, profile will be denied. Then we have the architectures, which is the architectures that our uh, second profile is targeting. And then we have the list of syscalls. We can have different groups and we can have groups of allowed or groups of denied. In this case, uh, having groups of denied um, syscalls doesn't make much sense because we have them here uh, disabled by default. But we could set up the default action to log, which means, which means that if a syscall is not defined in our profile, but it gets used, it will be logged into the system that that syscall was used. Uh, that will help us, for example, to improve our second profiles. Then, as I, as I was mentioning, we have the syscall uh, section where we have the names of the accepted syscalls that uh, user that processes can use and the action for those syscalls. In this case, we have four syscalls and these four syscalls can be used. And as I was mentioning, we have three different actions that we can configure for our syscalls. The first one, it's allow the use of specified syscalls. The second one denies the use of specified syscalls. And the third one allows the use of uh, the syscalls, but locks the ones that are not specifically permitted. And with that, uh, we got to demo two, which, where we are going to see how we can use second uh, profiles on containers. For the next demo, we are going to see how we can create our own second profiles using a tool, which is the OCI hook project. Okay, so first thing first, we already installed the hook. Uh, you will have the instructions on the demo files. And what we are doing now is uh, one thing that is required is in order to run this hook, we need to run containers as root. So that's why I'm using sudo here. So we are running our container and we are adding this annotation to the container which is called IO containers trace syscalls. And then we are giving it an output file. In this case, uh, TMP ls.json. We are running this Fedora 32 image and we are running an ls on the root folder. Then we don't want to get any output on that command. So we are redirecting it to that null. So let's see what happened. Okay, so the execution is, is complete now. So if we take a look at the ls.json file, you can see that in order to run that ls command, those, these are the syscalls that were used, all these ones. And the hook um, already created the, um, the second profile for us. So we can see um, that by default, any syscall that it's not defined in there will be uh, blocked. And that we, we only allow these syscalls to to be used by our container. So what we can do now is we can run our container with this second profile. So we are saying, okay, security options, second, we want to use this profile, which is the one that we just generated. And we are going to run the same image, same command. Let's see if that works, okay? It works. So what's the next thing that we want to do? Okay, let's try what, what happens if we modify this command a bit. So let's uh, run an ls, minus L. Okay, if you look at this, it says, hey, cannot access root, operation not permitted. So that's probably because we are missing some syscalls. So what, what we are going to do now is uh, we are going to run this hook and we can do something really nice, which is, okay, 
Um, th now this is the input file, uh, which is TMP LS, and the output file, it's TMP LSL. So what will happen is that all the other syscalls that we um, got from the, pre the first execution will be appended to the ones that we get now. This is really useful when you are testing your application. And for example, let's say that you have an application with two endpoints. And in the first execution, you just tested one endpoint. And now you need to test the second endpoint. If for some reason, the different endpoints require of different syscalls, this is an easy way of um, merging all syscalls in a single file. So we are executing this command again. And now if we run a diff between both files, we can see that for running the ls-l, uh, we require these other um, syscalls that were not present in the previous um, profile. So what we are going to do now is using this profile, this new one, tmp-lsl.json to run this application again. And now we can see that the application got um, executed properly. And that finishes the demo around second profiles on containers. What we will see in a future demo is how we can leverage these profiles on Kubernetes. OK, now that we know how we can use capabilities and second profiles in containers in our local system, now it's the time to see how we can do the same thing on Kubernetes. Capabilities in Kubernetes have some limitations at the moment when not using UID zero on your workloads, or what is the same when you're not running your containers with the user root. That's because the ambient capabilities are not supported in Kubernetes, but this will be solved in a future uh, Kubernetes enhancement. In this case, user namespace can help, but at this point, support for user namespaces has made it to cryo and it should be fully supported in Kubernetes in the next releases. Running containers with a fixed UID such as zero has security implications. The processes sharing the same UID and with access to the same storage will be able to read and write the files from that storage. And also if you can break out of the container due to a vulnerability, probably in the runtime, you will be able to see processes and files on the host owned by that UID. In those cases, uh, tools like Selenux will help reducing the attack surface in the node. While ambient capabilities make it to Kubernetes, we can use file capabilities or capability aware programs. We will see that on the demo. On this slide, you can see the privilege escalation. And there is a lot of text here, but you need to know that uh, when you are using file capabilities or capability aware programs on Kubernetes, um, you need those containers to be able to run privilege escalations because you will be uh, running a non root process. And that non-root process needs to become a more privileged process. So that requires that privilege escalation. You have a lot more information around that in this slide. Uh, you can check it after the talk. And with that, um, we are going to see um, how we can configure capabilities on Kubernetes and the differences between running those containers on our local machine and running those containers in Kubernetes. OK. For this demo, what we are going to do is we are going to see how we can leverage capabilities on Kubernetes. The first demo that we will be seeing is the difference between a pod running with UID zero versus a pod running with non-root UID on Kubernetes. So first thing first, we create a namespace for our test. Um, we are going to call it test capabilities. Okay, so we have our, um, our namespace created and now we're going to create a, a pod. In this pod, as you can see, we are giving the name reverse words app cap test. So we are using the same image that we were using previously on the local test. Uh, we give it, give it a name and the container reverse words, as you can see, will be executed as user ID zero. Okay, we run this thing. And then after some time, uh, we will get the pod running and we will be able to exit to it. Let's wait a bit. Let's see how it goes. OK, it's still container creating. Let's wait for it. OK, now it's running. So let's try again. OK, and now you can see that um, the, the capability sets are a bit different from what we have seen on our local execution. Let's decode them. 
So in this case, we have less capabilities than the ones that we had in, in Podman. Why? Because this is an OpenShift cluster and it's using Cryo under the hood. And, uh, and those are the default capabilities assigned to Cryo, as assigned by Cryo. Okay. So um, now what we are going to do is we are going to run the same image, but with an on root UID. So in this case, we are running the, the container as user 124. Okay. So let's get the pods. Okay. It's running now. So what we are going to do is we are going to grab uh, for capabilities. And here you can see the difference. In this case, since this container is running with a non root UID, you can see that the permitted set, the effect and the effective set are, are cleared. In this case, you can see that the ambient capabilities are also clear. That's normal because ambient capabilities are not supported by Kubernetes yet. So you will always get this uh, capability set um, clear. So if you remember um, from the slides, now that we have the ambient set clear, that only leave, leave us with two options. Uh, if we want to run an application in a non with a non-root UID that requires capabilities. And those options are uh, just file capabilities or uh, program capability aware programs. Okay, so this finishes this first demo. And next, we are going to see how we can run an application with NetBind service on Kubernetes. Okay, for this first deployment, we are going to run our application with root UID and drop every runtime capability but NetBind service. Okay, so let's uh, create the deployment. So I will post here, as you can see, uh, we are running this container as UID zero, and now we are going to drop the capabilities that are assigned to every container by the runtime automatically. So in this case, uh, we want to drop all these uh, capabilities. And now uh, we want to add NetBind service. That way our container will only have access to the NetBind service capability. Okay, and now uh, let's get the logs for this application. As you can see, the application is listening on port 80. So that, that worked well. If we check the capability um, sets for this uh, application, let's see what we get. Okay, so as you can see, um, we get, we only got the NetBind service capability added to the different capability sets. That's expected. So what we are going to do now is we're going to drop all the runtimes capabilities again. And on top of that, we're going to add NetBind service capability and request the application to run with a non-root UID. Okay, so let's do that. Um, again, I will post on capabilities. As you can see, different things here. Uh, we are running as user ID uh, 124. And now we want to drop uh, the default, the runtime's default capabilities as we did before. And now we want to add a uh, NetBind service. So at this point, the only difference between the two containers is that the former one is running with um, UID zero and this one will run with a non-root UID. Let's see what happens. Okay. If we get the logs, you can see that we got a permission denied. Okay, at this point, um, you might think uh, why it's failing because we ran this, this test on Podman and it worked. But I will tell you something. Uh, this is in Podman, it worked because the ambient capabilities, if you remember that ambient capability uh, was the one allowing us to get that capability on the other um, threat capability sets, like the permitted and effective. And this is not happening in Kubernetes because as I mentioned earlier, ambient capabilities are not supported on Kubernetes yet. So what we are going to do is we are going to patch our application so we can access to it. Uh, we are um, changing the app port from 80 to 8080, and that will allow us to access the container. In this case, we want to get the, the capability sets. Okay, you can see that we have in the inherited set, we have the NetBeam service capability. 
okay? And the same goes for the bounding set. So what are our options? Our options now are using capability aware programs or use file capabilities. So let's do that. What we, what we are going to do now is we are going to, to patch the uh, deployment again. We are setting the port back to port 80 and we're changing the image by the one that has uh, our binary with the NetBind service file capability configured. So let's do that. Okay, so that probably takes some time for the image to be pulled. So let me run get bots here. Okay, it's container creating. Let's wait a bit. Okay, the container is running now. So what we can do is we can get the logs. And you can see that now uh, our container is listening on port 80. And if we check the thread capabilities for the process number one, which is the process for our application, uh, now we see that the permitted and the effective set got uh, this NetBind service assigned. So that is because when, when our binary was executed, uh, the file capability was there and we had that capability in the bounding set and that allowed the permitted and effective set to get that capability as well. And checking the capability on the file, on, on the binary file, you can see that we have uh, this netbind service capability on the reverse words binary. And with that, we finish the demo around capabilities on Kubernetes. And now that we have seen how capabilities work on Kubernetes, we're going to see how we can use second profiles in Kubernetes. By default, Kubelet will try to find second profiles in the uh, bar lib Kubelet second path, uh, but this path can be, can be configured in the Kubelet configuration file. You can have multiple second profiles in the same folder. And remember that Kubernetes runs everything as unconfined by default, that if you remember from previous slides, means that all syscalls are available for the processes to use. And in Kubernetes 1.22, as we mentioned earlier, uh, a new Alpha feature will allow users to configure a default second profile. And with that, uh, let's see how we can use second uh, profiles on Kubernetes. Okay, so in this demo, we are going to see how we can use second profiles on Kubernetes. So before we started with this demo, what I have done is I added uh, a profile to my worker nodes. So I can, I can run this command here and you will see how uh, one of my worker nodes have this pro has this profile CentOS 8-LS profile loaded on its um, barlib kubelet secomp uh, folder, which is the default one, if you rem remember from these slides. So this, uh, ls profile what allows us is to run the ls command right that we tested uh, locally before so what we're going to do now is we're going to create uh, a namespace like we did before and now we can configure the second profile at pod or container level this time we're going to configure it at pod level meaning that all containers within the pod will use this profile so this pod as you can see uh, is using security context second profile type localhost because in this case uh, we are using a local profile. We could use default and we would get the default OpenSIF second profile that as we mentioned in the slides, it restricts the number of syscalls that can be done. And this is the file that we are using, CentOS 8 LS. We are running this image and then we are running this command, LS uh, uh, on the root folder. So let's see what happens. Okay, it's been created. So let's see. Okay, you can see it's completed and that um, it was able to list the different folders. So what we're going to do now is we're going to run another pod, but in this case, uh, we are running ls-l. If you remember, in Podman, this failed. Let's see what happens in OpenSIF. And also, you can see that this time, instead of setting the second profile at pod level, we are setting it at container level. So we can have different containers using different profiles. Okay, so we created the pod. And now, if we get the blocks, you can see that we get 
the same error that we got uh, previously when we ran this demo on Podman. And with that, uh, the demos around second are finished. Okay, so now that you have seen how you can use capabilities and second profiles on Kubernetes, the next question will be, okay, how can I manage capabilities and second on Kubernetes and OpenSea? In this presentation, we have been using capabilities and second without talking into account authorization for these resources and other stuff. In a real world scenario, you want to restrict which user have access to what capabilities or second profiles. In OpenSea, we have a security context constraint or SCCs that provides an out of the box standard security defaults, uh, support for complex ordering, and those are enabled by default. In Kubernetes, uh, we have pod security policies that can be used for controlling this as well, but they have a few drawbacks. Like there are no defaults, you need to define them. The default ordering is not that good, then it's still not enabled by default in, in Kubernetes. So you need to enable it on the API server. It they will be deprecated in Kubernetes 1.21 uh, and the community is working towards pod security admission that will be the PSP replacement, the pod security policies replacement. You have the Kubernetes enhancement proposal on the slides. And with that, um, the talk is over. Um, you have more resources if you want on this on the links on the screen. Uh, you have access to the live demos that we have done on the last uh, link on this slide. And with that, if you have any questions, feel free to send them over to mario at redhat.com. And thank you again for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the rest of DEFCON US. Take care. Bye.